There are two very important questions about the story that Jesus told about the man and his two sons, both of which are left unanswered by the text. But they really should be the questions we ask, even though we can't quite find the answer. The first question is, did the second son actually go into the feast after he was confronted by his father or not? Did he come in to salvation or in anger over others being saved? Did he reject it all and leave? That's the first question. The second question is, where's Jesus in the parable? Is Jesus the father who runs out to meet and forgive? And if so, well then, that's fine, but then where is God the father in the parable? But if Jesus is not the Father, then who is he and how does he fit? And I don't know that we have easy answers to either of these, but they do kind of become what we should know from the rest of Scripture. So the first question is one that is supposed to cut us, supposed to make us worry a little bit about what we believe and where do we stand. I mean, it's very easy to assume We are the prodigal son, yes? Of course we're the repentant ones. Of course we're the ones coming home, beating our breasts, saying, Dear Lord, have mercy on us. That's where we put ourselves in the story right away. But who is this other son? This one who is steadfast and obedient, always present, who then nonetheless seems to be upset about grace. Why do we not assume that that is also us? And hear about, look at our jeopardy in this. The danger that is over us when we don't ask, is this me? Or when we don't say, repent of it. Perhaps the real reckless living of the first brother that we are supposed to repent of is not whatever you did when you were 20 years old, but is in fact instead what you did this last week as you thought too highly of yourself because of whatever you've achieved and done gloriously and right. We are supposed to, in this parable, be brought to repentance, be brought to fear, be brought to seeing that nobody deserves to go into the feast. However you might line up or describe your own past, your own sinful condition, whatever thoughts went through your head during that moment, that quiet moment a little while ago where we confessed our sins and then the hymnal says, a moment of silence silence exists for private confession before God. Whatever went through your head there, right? That should be something that is, well, not something you're proud of. Something that disturbs you. Something that you know means you don't even have a right to be here. And it's when you know that, it's when you know you don't have a right to be here, that the Father running recklessly toward you, to embrace you, cover you, and pull you into the feast, well, that suddenly has meaning. There is no meaning to salvation if there is nothing to be saved from. There's a lot of really neat stuff in this parable, little tidbits and quirks that we could pull apart. I'm sure you've heard it before in other sermons on the text. It's such a famous text. First off, I mean, the idea that a 20-year-old son would go to his father and say, give me half of what you own, I'm gone. I mean, this is beyond ludicrous. This is to say, Dad, I, I would rather you were dead right now And the dad goes, okay, sure thing, here you go. Like, that doesn't happen in real life. It wouldn't happen in real life. It's it's weird. And you can actually see then why the other brother might be a little upset later. This son of yours, who would rather you were dead, now comes crawling home asking for help. What a jerk. Then he goes off, and at least so far as I remember this from childhood, uh, It's always played up, the bad decisions he went off and made, the the foolhardiness. So that's fair enough. He squandered the money one way or the other. There's more than one way to, to ruin finances. 
What I find really fascinating is that where he ends up is amongst the lowest of the low. So we maybe think of sleeping with pigs as being gross because it stinks, right? But remember that these are Hebrews. It's not just that the pig smells and is in the mud. The pig is an unclean animal on a spiritual level. It is unworthy to be eaten or sacrificed or had in any way, shape, or form. And that's where this young man ends up. So he's not merely dirty, say, sexually or because of his drunken decisions. He is dirty spiritually at this point as well. He is removed from his God. He is so far away from from everything. He is the chief of sinners, as it were. And then there's this moment where he realizes, though. But is is it true faith? I don't know. He realizes it's better off with my dad as his slave than by myself as a king. It reminds me a little of a line that Lucifer has in Paradise Lost, John Milton's great epic poem about the fall of mankind. The poem is not really a fair representation of the history of the fall, but there is a lot of spiritual truth behind it. And Lucifer, finding himself in the fires of hell and uh, having been cast out of heaven, deciding to drag himself up with his armies and, and strike out against mankind in vengeance, says, better to rule in hell than serve in heaven. And what the young man here is realizing is what a lie that is. Better to be a slave in heaven than to rule in hell. So he gets up and he goes back to his father. He's got his speech all prepped. But the father does the most astounding thing. And it begins with the fact that he ran. Now for us in our sedentary lifestyles, we don't run either because we don't like to. That'd be me. Uh, Or we run because we need to stay healthy. That'd be a lot of people who are maybe more righteous physically than me. But back in the day, this, this time period, first century, men did not run. It would be considered embarrassing for you to run. You would run if you were going to war or if you were running away from war. That was it. And this was doubly difficult because you'd be dressed like me with this robe on. Can you imagine running with this thing? You know what you got to do? You got to do that, right? And that's exactly what this man would have done. So he hikes up his skirt and he runs, his knees showing, which would have been highly embarrassing, out to his son, which displays to you the utter love that he had for this boy. Now, most of us who have children can understand that. Perhaps if you don't have children, you might think of your own parents. It, it continues to be something that's, that makes me almost choke up, though, to, uh, to remember or imagine this. That this is not merely a man seeing his son and running. This is then, at the heart, God responding to your need. You, at best, are coming back saying, I will try to earn my forgiveness I will be your slave. I will do whatever I must do. And he, he can't help but embarrass himself to come hug you and draw you close. And so one way or the other, whether this is to be heard and seen as the Father, God the Father, or God the Son, one way or the other, it is the cross. It is the moment where God embarrasses himself to save you. He then gives out these tremendous gifts, uh, the best robe in the house, which would have been reserved for himself, a ring on the finger, which would have made him able to command all the servants to do whatever needed to be done, the fattened calf, this would have been saved usually for spiritual festivals, for, for Passover or for Feasts of Atonement, those kinds of things. So this is a very uh, expensive beast. This is better than just a filet mignon. This is a wedding feast kind of thing. All of that's going on as well with implications for our salvation and what paradise has in store. All the good gifts of the resurrection that God has planned for us. There's so much there. We could dig on that for a long time as well. But then you get to this other issue, right? There's music. There's feasting. The son has been restored. He was dead and he's alive. There's resurrection in that as well. And then you have this other son who remembers what his brother did. Remembers the hate his brother showed for his father and for that reason decides that hate is the answer and this is then the 
disturbing, scary thing about our unbelief. Unbelief can pretend to be good. It can do good things. It can be a quote-unquote righteous person. But it will do so in hate. It will do so in a pursuit of justice. It will do so seeking personal reward. The thing he says to his father in his anger is pretty telling. I did all this work for so long and you never paid me back. If we pursue Christianity and our discipline as Christians in order to get paid back, then we are the most pitiable of people. We are people with hearts filled with hate who wouldn't love our neighbor unless we earned something by it. And that is the great danger again. Why is Jesus telling this parable? Is he telling this parable to keep people from going out and sleeping with prostitutes? No. Now there's texts of the Bible that want us to not do that. Don't get me wrong. But the context tells us pretty clearly there are prostitutes in the audience as he's telling the parable. And the point is to convince the people who don't think they should be there that maybe the ones who don't think they should be there aren't actually there, aren't listening, aren't believing, and are about to walk away from the faith, the faith which they claim to have so strongly. And of course, we know historically that's exactly what happens. The Pharisees end up killing them. Some of them are converted after the resurrection, but most of them are not. And they end up persecuting the early church and driving them out of Jerusalem. So Jesus has every right to say this to them. What we want to do then is see what Jesus conceives to be the more dangerous sin. The more dangerous sin is not commandments 5 through 9. Murder, sex, lies, stealing, covetousness. The more dangerous sin is commandments 1 through 3. Not believing in the true God and your need of him. Not using his name as one who has a hunger and a drive for mercy. And rejecting his words when his words tell you that the real threat to you is your own self-righteousness. The real threat to you is how good you think you are. That's what we must repent of most. Again, the parable ends without <clears throat> Jesus ever telling us what happens. We don't know if the son repents and enters the feast or not. Now, I think that's on purpose. I think that's so that we will ask this question and so that we will realize we are not the first son but the second son. And then we will beat our breasts over our self-righteousness and enter the feast. That we will put ourselves in the story and complete the story by hungering and seeking the Lord our God and his mercy. Which then brings us back to that second question I asked. Where is and who is Jesus in this? And you have two options, frankly, and they're both fine. They're both good. The first is that he is the Father. That God the Father is not really in the parable. right? God the Father is behind and through and acting in Jesus. Which he does often. That's good theology there. And so Jesus is the one running down to meet him, embarrassing himself by his death on the cross putting the, the cloak which is his righteousness onto you and the ring on your finger which is your authority to rise from the dead on the last day, that all works great. That's fine. I'm kind of partial to the second one, though, which is that Jesus suddenly becomes the prodigal son. The prodigal son is, is you and me at first when he says to the father in Adam, in the fall, I rebel against you. Give me paradise. Give me the earth. Let me give it to the devil. It'll be better. And we wind up sleeping with the pigs. And then somewhere mysteriously behind all of that, lying in the muck, unclean as we are, Christmas happens. And Jesus of Nazareth is born of the Virgin Mary down in that stable. Not with pigs, but with ox and ass. And as you know, the story goes. And then man at that moment awakens. Mankind has a reason for hope. Mankind remembers his Father. And Jesus draws us in himself back to the Father. And one might say, well, how could Jesus be that man in the parable? This man's a sinner. Yes. And remember what 2 Corinthians told us this morning. He who knew no sin 
became sin for us. Jesus on the cross is a sinner. Returning to his father, beating his breast, saying, let me be but a slave beneath you. And what does the father do to Jesus? He raises him from the dead and takes him into the feast, which is exactly what Christ has done, ascended into heaven right now for us. And we're down here outside the feast with servants of the Lord coming and saying to us, go into the feast. Stop refusing to be forgiven yourself. Know that we're all in the same boat. The son who was dead, Jesus of Nazareth, is alive. Mankind who was lost in Adam has been found in him. And now everyone is invited. It's all a free gift. Now certainly that way of understanding the parable is new. It it is new to this century, honestly. And only a few Lutheran pastors here and there preach it. So if you like the first one, that's fine too. They both give us the same theology, the same truth. What we confessed in our creed a few moments ago. What I said pretty clearly even a few moments ago. That in Adam all have died. That in Christ all are made alive. That this is a free gift given to us by his righteousness for you. To save you from your self-righteousness. And draw you in himself back to the Father. On this joyful middle day within the harsh season of Lent, it is glorious to remember that the whole point of all is not that we would beat our breasts. The point of beating our breasts is that our Lord would then reach down and lift up our eyes and draw us in to everlasting life. In the name of Jesus, amen.